ahead and get started. Appreciate everyone's patience. Just give a few minutes for additional folks to join us today. Uh, I'm Jeremy McPike, uh, State Senate uh, for the Plain Head District, which is um, half of Woodbridge, uh, Dale City, uh, especially as I said, Manassas and Manassas Park. So kind of between Prince William Parkway and 234, from 95 almost to 66. So, so I find a little between us. Uh, Sprigs of Miniville and Sprigs, two blocks from 234, and I am your... Richard Stewart, or Scott Serbo, is white. Scott Serbo. Yeah. Where do you vote? At Sprigs and the... Forest High School. Forest High School. Forest Park. Scott. Forest Park. Scott. Yep. Oh, I didn't know you were going to go. Oh, you didn't know that? Okay. I am. It's a great county to live in. Okay. And, and first off, happy belated birthday to Delegate Buesman. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah, and I'm Delegate Elizabeth Buesman. Yeah. Thank you. Happily turned 47. Oh, <laughs> right. days ago. You're so young. Oh, thanks. Baby. I just don't count them anymore. <laughs> Kids learn to read 
they can learn the rest of the subject. You know, if they feel the comfort um, very early in life and their skill set in reading, the data says that we do much better off versus remedial training later on. And so this is really the first budget that we've seen this sort of significant, significant investment um, in our education system, which is great. On the back end of it, you see also the, the availability for college, uh, community college, which I think is just great for, for those kids who do qualify for Pell Grants. There's free community college that's proposed in the budget as well. Uh, if we we're gonna be serious about getting every kid the skills that they need, uh, we know that we have very bright kids in our community that sometimes feel like they can't go to the next step uh, because of their financial worries or other worries. And so the more we can open up those opportunities, I think the better we do at leveraging our, our talented kids. Uh, some of them right here in Bevel Middle School. And uh, you know, we want to make sure that kids have that, whether it's a skill trade or computer science, there's targeted degrees that the governors put in this budget. And I think that helps to link up both our workforce development needs as well as ensuring those kids uh, have access. So those, those are, uh, I think, some important highlights. Transportation, um, there's some bills on transportation that are going through that are really important. They will, um, there's a proposed force and increase in the back gas tax that will help to fund some of our transportation. We are billions behind our projected funding level. As you know, the 2013 legislation made a small dent in that. That was the first thing that changed since 1986 in terms of transportation planning. There are certain things that uh, we also proposed for Metro two years ago that took some of the roadable money away. We're restoring some of that through the transit occupancy tax. Um, but for this region, it's really important for Princeton County, um, the in improvements and investments in the area. Uh, you might have seen the report with the Long Bridge. It's the bridge that all the rail lines bottleneck as they cross into DC. So all the VRE trips right now are running to roughly 22 trips a day. By making this investment in Long Bridge, we'll be able to do also weekend trips, reverse trips, uh, and increase the number of trips uh, from the Great Expert Line. Part of that's going to be funded from the um, IC6 um, toll leverage <coughs> dollars for bond funding. Uh, but this is a $1.4, $1.5 billion multi-year project to get there. And then for the commuter rail, that's just a huge difference. Right now, we, we can't do anything more in terms of capacity on the VRE lines. And so the more car, you know, more folks we can get utilizing with the more frequent and reliable service, the more people we can get, um, you know, not necessarily back jammed in roads and open up those uh, commuter routes. So um, I'll, uh, we're gonna take a couple pauses and then trade back and forth because there's a number of different moving parts, but I think those are two pretty significant ones. So just to piggyback on early childhood education, one part that is gonna be different than years prior, you probably know that Princeton County was not taking advantage of that, all the money that was available for preschool education before, for this year. So right now, through this new legislation, Virginia Preschool Initiative that was only for four-year-olds is going to be expanded to three-year-olds as well. So that is great, you know, because there are going to be opportunities. And then also uh, what is going to happen is that they are going to allow family child care providers in the community to go through the recertification process so they can get access to that money to provide services in the community. But there's one caveat this time around. It's not the same, like the money's gonna sit there, you don't use it, and it's gonna just be waiting for you. The difference now is that if we don't use the money in Virginia County, the money's gonna go away where it's needed. So I think that as a community, we have to work together to try to work with local government and to work with providers in that area to make sure that we're gonna take advantage of those opportunities. I mean, we are leading the numbers, I mean, at the bottom of the list, when we are with the amount of children that we are serving in Virginia County, and then we child for education, and that's not something to be proud of. It's really hard to qualify, you know, what the median household income in Virginia County is about $100,000, $120,000 per household, so that makes us ineligible to any type of freebies when it has to do with free childcare or anything like that. And with BPI and by increasing the minimum wage, all of those poverty guidelines is gonna, are going to go up. 
who's going to be opening opportunities to new families, new individuals to be eligible to these services. Uh, as another important investment on um, public schools as well, I would say that we are securing the funding to reduce the case loads for school counselors, money that was taken away at the end of the session a year ago. But also, I mean, this is, at, at least Dell City, it's a majority minority area where we have a lot of English language learners and students. So our job is just to not leave anybody behind, and we need more resources. Right now, the classes for English language learners is 20 teachers for a thousand students. So we are going, we tried to reduce that to 17 this year, but then we couldn't find the money, you know, and we have to increase it to 18.5. Now I learned it the same way like you did this morning, that there is money available that the governor has found, 20 uh, to 100 million dollars, so I'm hopeful that we can go back and change these bills that we allow more opportunities the goal was to have, uh, sorry, that it's 17, 17 teachers for a thousand students. So we're trying to put 20 teachers to a thousand students. So I, it's just, it, that, that's the reality right now that we're living, you know, in public schools. We are dealing as Senator McPike was saying, was saying is that we're playing catch up because public education was not a priority for many years. In 2018, we were working with the same budget in public education from 2008. Mm -hmm. And how our community has grown, how many people, if we just look around, the, I mean, how many houses, how many students do we have in the community and we're working with the same budget. So fields like school counselors, psychologists, social workers, were hit really hard on special education classrooms. On special education, we are uh, working with JGAR. They mm -hmm. are doing a whole revision of the whole system, uh, and just to look at what can we do for special education uh, classes that has not been touched since 2009. The last time we discussed special education in the Virginia Assembly was 2009. And we all know that back then mental health was a stigma. You know, there were, uh, there are still many children and parents that are realizing that their children have a condition and they need more resources. So we are glad of the administration, our very own Secretary of Education, Abel Carney, has well, taken well, from well, Bevel Middle, Middle School, has taken, you know, these very, it's close, it's close, it's working really, really hard to try to provide more resources to special education classrooms. As far as transportation, uh, we are going to finally have, hoping, hoping, you know, that the FASA Senate, the FASA is included in both budgets, uh, having a study for Metro. And Finally, <laughs> and this is just a study, and I don't want you to think that this will happen in a couple of years. No, it's a long-term goal. It's gonna take at least 15 years, 12 years, if not 20 years, to bring uh, Metro to Prince William County back. We're gonna have more VRE services. Uh, we need to work with PRTC. The last time that I met with PRTC, I told them that what I heard at the doors, because we do have a lot of commuters, but we don't have places parked if we wanted to take advantage of the VRE system. And there's no places to find parking. There's no, we, there's no room to, to build a new commuter lot in Prince William County. So we are talking about trying to have shuttles to allow people to travel from where they live to take them to the commuter lots. I was also promised uh, to see if we can have finally a Dell City Omni Ride service that could I mean, like, allow people to travel with Dell City. There's the population that we have right now in Dell City is very close to what we have in Manassas right now. So we wanted to have allow people that are working locally don't, to stay out of their cars and try to take public transportation to go to work. You know, I, I told the PRTC director that if we, if you wanted to take advantage of the VRE, we need to think outside the box about making making it more accessible for people. So if I'm asking my husband to drop me off at the VRE station so I can take the train, that is inconvenient to me because my husband is taking off from work to take me. So I we had to talk about the community and trying to find ways to take people to 
take people to a VRE station with local resources. You know, I think we invested a lot of money on PRTC to get uh, to have more buses. We have now buses in Gainesville that take people to Penetrate and Washington DC. But now we need to take care of our own need in the locale. A um, couple things that um, the legislation that I've been specifically working on, and I'm trying to delegate these people to do the same, we will open up the questions of what we may not have covered um, this morning with you. Um, and Alan, you just mentioned transportation part of it, so hopefully you caught some of the transportation funds, because I know that's something that's really interesting to you as well. Um, this year I've worked on, um, you know, many of you know, the last couple of years I've been working on natural gas pipeline safety based on the house that exploded in my district in Woodbridge. Um, this year, also, um, removing, there's currently an exemption in Virginia state law that allows the natural gas companies to not use a professional engineer when they stand, when they submit drawings and plan for construction. Um, after the Massachusetts explosion and fires that occurred in DSB, it's sort of led the 22 states that have that exclusion exemption to remove it. And so I'm preparing the, the bill this year to remove that legislation and ensure that any of this infrastructure is reviewed and signed by a professional engineer. Um, additionally, I've been two different pieces of legislation I've worked on. I actually, since last year, passed the Senate, but got killed in the House, which is requiring lead water testing in child daycare facilities. Um, there is lead facilities. The federal laws cover essentially the water distribution systems, but not when it gets into the facility. And so the solder joints um, and different pipes still contain uh, certain parts of lead. And so it does require a testing standard. I don't think anybody wants, you know, lead contaminated water going into baby formula or anything else, or just basic drinking water in child care facilities. Um, that's a big um, impediment to neurological growth. Um, and also getting the school's resources um, in coordination with the Virginia Department of Health, who took the existing lead water standard I carried in the past two years ago for schools to make sure we understand a holistic view of the problem around the state and to begin to identify resources to that. So I have a budget amendment on that as well that helps that office start to aggregate some of the data so we can get schools some of that help. They do have a federal grant. They were awarded uh, last year so about $33,000. Obviously, that's a drop in the bucket, so to speak. So we've got a lot of work um, still to do on that. One of the other big bills that worked on this year and carried for the governor's office is worker misclassification. Um, this primarily impacts uh, the construction trades. But there are other industries that do as well that do not follow the IRS guidelines in terms of who should be a 1099 worker and who should be an employee. And what occurs is, especially in the construction jobs, is there are lots of companies who essentially 1099 a bunch of employees, so they're not paying the same taxes. So there's Vendors that undercut those who are doing business the right way, and Virginia has been very lax about that enforcement. And so this creates a, a new enforcement mechanism within the Department of Taxation, as well as coordinating with the Department of Labor and other agencies, and creates some some penalties for those who are bad actors. Uh, right now, companies can open up and close really with little um, penalties associated. And, it, and it's unfortunately because it does hurt, like I said, the good actors, the companies that are doing the right thing. So this finally gets a little bit more teeth and enforcement uh, mechanism into our law. Um, so those are, those are a couple, there's a dozen other things I'm doing. Can you see reform, um, cutting the number of permit types in half, just update, updating um, alcohol licenses based on new business and business standards. Uh, after prohibition, we really didn't anticipate like Wegmans would be like, selling you a case of beer, but they're also serving, that you know, there's all sorts of business models in addition to the new distilleries and how they want to innovate. And so it's really consolidating I don't know, about 100 pages of code section and reducing, cutting essentially the, the what we call Christmas tree effect when we sort of add on new permit types and just consolidating uh, certain license authorities so to make it a lot easier for people to apply for licenses. Uh, additionally, this year there's a, a bill going through that expands on my bill from last year that allows for open carry of alcohol. If you've been to Manassas First Fridays, you notice that you can have a restaurant that's sell a beer if you have a closed down special event area. And so Manassas has taken advantage of this year where they close down the streets on First Fridays. And so the restaurateurs can serve a meal. You can also have a beer. You can go out and carry the street, which are closed down. 
it, it's sort of a, you walk into the area, listen to a live band, and uh, I know the Manassas restaurateurs, they exceeded all their like all-time sales high by like 8.30, I think the second night, mm -hmm. some of them were telling me. So it's, it's a huge, fun. huge boom for the city. Yeah. So and I think everyone's been very happy with it. I don't think we've heard any complaints. Yeah, I've, I've checked with the chief of police there and others in terms of enforcement issues. She said there's been none. Um, so there's been a really great net positive, but now it's sort of catching on. So lots of other parts of the state want it. So there's a bill this year that would increase it to 16 as well as allow if you have a multi-day permit, it would only count as one. So some localities have like a, a festival or something that would count as one of those permits. So it's just encouraging people in historic downtowns. 16, 16 counties? No, 16 permits a year. So it's a limited duration permit. Uh, right now the current code is 12. Um, so this would up to 16, but also account for if you had a sort of a, a weekend long festival on Friday to Sunday, that wouldn't count for, for three of those, that sort of count for one, sort of a total of that. Um, so, anyway, All right. pass it off to Billy Guzman. Okay, so let's talk about public health and just see what we are talking about. So I would start with, I am sending a bill to the Senate that will study people, A's and PFAS. It's uh, for a uh, very, Familiar. Many people that are very familiar with the environment here are chemicals that are found actually in public water that cause cancer. So we are conducting a study with the Department of Health, and they will absorb the cost to test at least 700 water parks for PFAS and PCOA. And in fact, at the House with unanimous support, so I'm hoping that we'll do the same in the Senate. <laughs> and uh, we have now uh, the votes, uh, so I don't want to. I don't think we'll be surprised. <laughs> My bill that I introduced last year that was killed to 49 votes he, uh, about increasing the age of um, the sponsor group in the presence of whom it is illegal to smoke in a motor vehicle with minors under age. He finally passed. So if you are smoking, you will not be allowed, I'm sorry, to smoke with your children in the car. I think this is just a public health issue. It's one of the main causes why children are getting to smoke in as they grow up and being exposed for so long into smoke. I mean, it's just the right thing to do. Children's lungs are not developed and we need to protect children. So in that bill, I was able to get some bipartisan support, so I'm excited about that. As far as um, changing facilities with the Department of General Services, I have a request from one of my constituents who is a single father, that he visited a couple of states and buildings, and he couldn't find a changing table in the men's bathroom. Mm -hmm. yeah. So finally, we were able to partner with the Department of General Services, so we will have at least one bathroom per gender with changing tables. So yes, because they are, and there are so many women nowadays that are, you know, being the head of households, and parents are taking their fathers, are taking the responsibility of taking care of their children as well. So I'm excited about that bill. It came with unanimous support. I hope it go. It already passed the committee in the Senate. Yeah, yeah General <coughs> I'm hoping that it will uh, go uh, well in the Senate. As far as I want to talk about the environment a little bit, I was partnering with the Green New Deal, and I carry a couple of legislations for them. I was successful. You know, to pass a comprehensive plan transit oriented development that is asking localities, localities with more than 100,000 citizens and cities with more than 20,000 citizens to include uh, affordable housing, to include public transportation and their comprehensive plans anytime they are developing a five or 10 or 15 year comprehensive plan. Uh, I, Past the Senate, it's on the way to go to the governor's desk, so I'm excited about that. Uh, talking about the Green New Deal uh, as well, I am carrying a House resolution that passed the House, it's only in the Senate, have not heard yet where Virginia will become the first state in the country to declare that there is a climate emergency and we need to act as soon as possible. Change is real, and we need to start acting now. 
uh, I have seen my, some of my um, union here brothers and sisters. So I am hearing legislation about collective bargaining that will allow public employees to uh, bargain collectively. Uh, it passed the House, it's on its way to the Senate. I was notified Friday evening that it will be heard on Monday in Labor and Commerce in the Senate. Commerce and Labor, oh, sorry, oh, the House is Labor and Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> commerce and Labor in the Senate. So I just wasn't able to speak with, with the leader of the Senate yet. We actually had a casual conversation on Friday and we set up a meeting on Wednesday to talk about collective bargaining, but then my view my is scheduled for Monday. So I'm hoping that I can pass it by so I can have the opportunity to lobby for it with senators before it gets heard uh, in the Senate with the members of Commerce and Labor. We'll see if I'm successful. If not, you know, we have a very good version that is coming from the House going to the Senate. And I just don't want to do that, <laughs> but if I have to, I may, <laughs> where it's allowing uh, not only to, I mean, allow public employees to bargain collectively, uh, but also partnering with the Commonwealth, with the Attorney General, where he said that if we are going to do this, then we need to have a structure to put it in place. And the structure to put it in place is to create a public, public employee, employees relations board that will have the <coughs> members, that those members will be assigned by the governor, and we are, have allocated money to also hire some hearing officers, so anytime there has to be an issue in between an employee and an employer in the public sector, the PERF, the Public Employee Relations Board, could set, could set a hearing officer to be the mediator in between the employer and the employee before we go to court. I think it's that's something that could benefit everybody. Nobody wants to go to court and as a union a public employee, we just wanted to be able to be listened. I think for me, my argument is that uh, I mean, some of the opposition will say, well, that means that we're gonna, uh, how much is it gonna cost? Is it gonna increase our taxes? Well, I could tell you right now that that is inaccurate because your governing bodies will continue to uh, maintain the power of appropriations, but we do. We, we, by having a voice at the table, we, you are going to have to listen to us, and we will make our case. We could say, for example, that one percent salary increase is not necessary. Firefighters could go on there. You know, the government is. I, they could advocate for better, you know, equipment, better resources to do their job. Police officers the same way. You know, if they are talking about buying new equipment, then they will have to talk to the police officers to tell, to come their buy in and coordinate with them what they need to do their job better. Teachers, you know, when we are talking about how we're gonna, uh, we're gonna include the 1% salary, so well, teachers are gonna make their case as how they are using their personal money to buy resources for the classroom, how it's important to have the smaller, the smaller classes, how they are putting many hours of their personal time for the schools, and these things need to be heard. The school board members need to listen from the teachers what is going on in the schools. As far as criminal justice reform, I finally uh, I sent a bill to the Senate, it was heard last week, uh, to increase the age of minors trial as adults. It came from the House with unanimous support. I was able to get support from the Court of Justice, even those who were before, like Delegate Rob Bell, who's not in Virginia. As the main block for criminal justice reform, he voted for my bill. And I took a picture of it because for me that was a story. <laughs> After debating with him for two years in a row and how my view was important, he finally agreed with me and voted for my view. And I was able to partner with the administration as well because it was a priority for them. You know, I'm trying to look at faces. Some of you have some requests. Expansion. You know, very important for many individuals. I introduced legislation, uh, but. I, I believe that some of the members were not ready yet, so those bills are have been sent to the Crime Commission. So the Crime Commission is going to send recommendations for next year so we can see why it's going to be allowed to be expunged or not. I mean, it's the reality is there. We all have been young, we all have made mistakes. I am in that group as well, but the reality is that you have to be carrying that with the rest of your life and that prevents you 
on having a federal uh, employment for working with children, even, I mean, riding a bus in the school system if you have a felony on your, uh, on your criminal record. So we have to change, you know, the criminal justice reform have not been touched also for many years. We're not trying to put criminals in the streets. I'm talking about individuals about my age that I just disclosed that if I made a mistake when I was 18 or 19 years old, and now I have proven that I'm a good citizen, that I have education, that I have learned from my mistakes. This is the country of second chances. So Virginia has to be the leader, you know, on uh, providing expungement services. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there, there's a tremendous amount going on. In fact, you know, this week was crossover week, so Tuesday night in the Senate, we were we gaveled out just about one o'clock in the morning. We take the floor at ten thirty that morning, previous morning. And so, you know, we've been going through marathon days to finish up our business. The House they do a lot of getting on the second read, so they did a little bit more the day before than on the crossover. But, but we have we moved the pending question after three comments. <laughs> we, we, we don't typically move the pending question, which means that the vote has to be taken in the Senate but in the House sort of rules of procedure. We, we let everybody debate. Um, if they have a voice, they're going to make sure they're, 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 those thoughts are, are shared. Unless it gets extraordinarily long for one speaker, then we might push things along a little bit. But uh, yeah, this week was an extraordinarily long week. Many things on the, not only the criminal justice reform, decriminalization of marijuana, um, the significant tweaks to the criminal justice system are fairly significant. And there are things in 20 years that have sort of stacked the deck uh, to one side, and we really started to tackle some of the structural injustice in how we um, treat cases, uh, both in you know, sentencing, um, different tiers, there's all sorts of nuance in the code right now that uh, we are starting to be into the fix, uh, which are really, really important. Uh, there's also been, um, I think some, obviously some big hot topics in terms of uh, gun safety legislation. Um, what passed the Senate was a uh, one gun a month, uh, universal background um, checks with certain provisions excluded in terms of the family. Um, it has to be a sale, so there's there's some certain transfer provisions. So for instance, if I'm out hunting on a tree stand, we don't create a, you know, unintended felony because I leave my gun to go, you know, clean the deer or whatever, and I left my gun with my buddy. I don't want to, you know, we try to avoid creating sort of um, unintended consequences through that in terms of what a transfer means. And so we, we did take out some of the original provisions to ensure that we didn't have folks that were caught in sort of innocent situations versus um, some of the gun show loophole and other sort of proxy sales that are going on. Um, so we, we certainly sort of tackled that as, a, as an approach. So we also did the one gun a month, which is returning to the legislation we had, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago that was Virginia law. Um, additionally, there, there are some provisions that passed the Senate that allow for um, local control for local uh, permits. Um, the local localities would have to post if you have a special permit that they, they don't want to um, have guns present at, they have to post it, they have to sign it, they have to get a public hearing notice, all sorts of other provisions to make sure that, again, it's not an unintended consequence. You can't just walk into a place and not, not have any notice that you're not supposed to carry. And so there's sort of those safeties that are, that are put in place. Um, certainly the other high topic was certain bills in relation to um, number of clips or add-ons. There's bills that pass the Senate that certainly ban uh, bomb stocks or trigger acted, activated devices. The, the bills dealing with um, round counts, or well, let's say that sort of assault rifles or assault weapons has not passed the Senate uh, based on their different definitions of both the round count and other issues that start to really get into some pretty nuanced stuff, but I know there's been a lot of hot topics on social media and other stuff, so I wanted to cover that. The other more recent one is on uh, driver's licenses for uh, new Americans or undocumented Americans, uh, or citizens here, not yet citizens, but try, working their way there. And, you know, I've seen a lot of social media sort of debate on this over the last week or so, it's really picked up um, on, you know, 
why we're doing this, why it's needed. If you look at it and break it down to the, the basic facts and figures, for folks who've been here many times in 20, 30 years, is folks have licenses in Maryland or other places. Right now, so their car is also registered in Maryland. That go through the Virginia safety inspection, nor do, is there an understanding of Virginia rules of the road and laws. And so there are provisions to provide uh, a license framework that requires passing of the test, driver test, having insurance, you know, all the other things that go with it in terms of safety inspection. So there's some, I think, some pretty strong uh, public safety interests um, in addition to the taxation, obviously, car tax and other things that go with it, registration fees that go with it to ensure that everyone has the same understanding of the, of the rules of the road. And so that's something that I know I've seen you know, people asking or emailing uh, about, you know, what are we doing? You know, it's people are, kind of for the comments of, well, people are getting something for free. It's not free. They got to play by the same exact rules as everybody else. No special conditions. And so I just want to make sure it's very clear, despite what you might see on social media, it's very stringent. Uh, the other question I heard was, well, what happened with New York? You know, the, the, the feds are now uh, clamping down on the preferred travel program, I forget what the exact name is, but essentially the frequent flyer preferred uh, TSA. Preferred entry program. Preferred entry program. The reason why they did that in New York is because they had locked down the database associated with it. The, Virginia, the law that we have that's going through has provisions that they can request, and law, law enforcement can still request in the DMV database a specific individual. It's just not part one. And so that takes care of the federal concern that had come up, and that's why New York is having problems. We don't have that same problem. We have avoided that issue by specifically writing in provisions into the code to avoid that issue. So I just want to address those couple things of you know what people are like, you know, calling or writing about and sort of address address those. I think there's some really important positive, there's many other important, I think, positive social in addition to the public safety and taxation around that issue. And this has been pending for, for many, many years, um, unfortunately. Um, but I think with now with real ID in place as well, it takes care of the flight issue in terms of the reason, essentially returns the law to where we were 2004, post 9-11, uh, in Virginia. That's what the law does. And because we have separate real ID, and you're, you're gonna require a real ID to board the domestic flight as it is, you're still gonna have that requirement. So that doesn't change any of that framework. So we now have the federal requirement as well as Virginia framework. So I think there's a lot of positives around that. So I wanted to cover, make sure we cover sort of those more hot topics that have been you know, swirling around Richmond or you've seen things on uh, social media. That makes sense. Still more, more to go. Thank you. I'd like to thank the senator. I really like this time about new American Center. Thank you. Meant the world to me. I appreciate it. So, and it's just like, as a leader myself, as the senator was talking about, this was a privilege that was removed from Virginia. Before 2003, anyone in Virginia could get a driver's license as long as they passed the test, knowledge test, road test, proof of residency, proof of residency and proof of identity in their passport. So none of that, we are just bringing back a law that was in Virginia before, that was taken away with false, uh, with misguided information, because it was taken after what happened on 9-11. And we all know now that none of the hijackers were new, I mean, were undocumented immigrants. So we are trying to bring our I mean, state dollars to people in Virginia, and bringing also local tax dollars to localities, because these individuals will pay, will pay property taxes where they live. So that money, is, instead of going to Maryland, instead of going to Washington, D.C., and not only that, because there's a lot of people that take advantage of this, and even though they are Virginia residents, they go and charge these individuals to present fake documents to be eligible to get a license in Maryland and Washington, D.C., and that's wrong. We need to stop all of that. And I think I want to thank the Senator for his support on that important piece of legislation. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing this year as well is trying to fight for the LGBT community a community that just couldn't have any type of uh, protections in general, uh, deployment, in housing, against discrimination. Myself, I had a couple of individuals who lived in my district that went to a state agency, and they were treated very poorly, you know, just for the way they go or for identifying who they are. And that is wrong, but for that, for that reason, 
consented legislation and it's going into the Senate that will require state employees to take the LGBTQ cultural competence first. That means I'm not asking them, you know, I just want them to know what it is like and they need to understand that community so they can help them because they're taxpayers, they can be who they want and they can love who they want, which is they are only just to use our services and to be confident. And we do it. I mean, we both work in Alexandria and this is already implemented in so many localities. It's part of your new employment orientation where we have to respect each other when we work together. Um, the other thing, real quick, I'll mm -hmm. jump back on the uh, driver's license uh, <coughs> privilege. Uh, one question I saw online or on email is for an indication that this would somehow allow people to vote that are not citizens. Mm -hmm. It does not do that. There's clear distinct distinctions that cross reference it. In fact, you know, the Senate provision has a, a list that's sent to the Board of Elections to make sure there's distinguishing factors of citizen and non citizen. So there's lots of ways that. Plus it's a felony. It's very clear. If you vote that you are not a citizen or to go and vote, even if you have a green card and you're not a citizen, that it's a felony and you can face deportation for voting uh, illegally. Okay. So that is that is the current law. You need to register to vote anyway. How are you going to register to vote? Well, yes. Right. Would there be an indication on the license itself that it's you're not? non-resident, if you will. It depends on what provision. If there are two bills available, one is driver's licenses and the other one is privilege cards. But the good news is that we all have already real IDs. And if you are a citizen, you get a star of being a real ID individual. So if you don't get the star, that means that you are not a citizen. But that doesn't mean you are undocumented either. You know, it could mean that you are a great car. I just decided I didn't want to go through the hassle because I don't fly. I think it's going to be mandatory at some point. Just for right? flying. Right. For flying. Okay. Well, for flying and getting on military bases. Oh, but, okay. but what some of the election laws that are also changing are the requirement for ID. You still would be required on some laws to, to show ID, but if you don't have the ID, you're still allowed to vote. You have to sign, and that's under the penalty of a felony. That's when this gets in. So both on the voter registration forms and other things, so it's right there, felony, and also in the election. If you come in and try to vote, you're putting a signature, you're, you're signing yourself for a felony if you're not registered. So that there are a number of different checks in both the databases, cross coordinated with DMV to the Board of Elections database. So there's a number of different ways with built in protections to that and to prevent. Yeah, and just uh, going back to my bills, I think one thing that I learned from what I was knocking is about drug prices. Everywhere I go, people were frustrated at the darkness where they have insurance, how much they have to pay for medicine. And insulin. And so we have, a, I'm sending a bill, a study to the Senate that will convene a work group to examine the pharmaceutical distribution payment system in the Commonwealth and innovative solutions to address the cost of prescription drugs. Drugs to Virginians at the point of sale. This work group will be led by the Secretary of Health and Human Resources. Uh, you know, we have different versions of how to change and how the price is calculated. Uh, that compromise was we're going to all be in a room. We're going to have all of the stakeholders that are part of that process. And we have to come up with a solution. And the solution is to be found by December. So in January, we can bring legislation. To um, just work on drug prices because it's getting just out of there's, our control. There's been some limited measures going through the Senate about pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs. Mm -hmm. As you might have seen on the news, it's all sort of discounts that drug manufacturers offer. Those discounts and benefits rebates that don't get passed on to the end user. Yeah. And so there's a lot of, you know, your plan plan pays for a certain point, and then they're also capturing the rebate on the other side. And so, and then the drug price is higher once they pass through the PBMs. And so, there's all sorts of sort of moving parts and shenanigans that are going on that yeah. they're, they're sort of doing one of these. It's, you know, it's not me. It's not my fault. The yeah. drug industry, I mean, uh, the factory, you know, it's not our fault. We're doing what we can do. Okay. So, we are just getting tired of this. Uh, Everybody can at each other. Yeah. Where, when you've got patents that, that have been on books for 50 years, there's nothing <laughs> new about or R&D or development that occurred with this drug. All that was 50 years ago. It's all done. And there's no need to you know, pay 600 times what some of these prices 
should be. It's all about the money. Yeah, and it's, it's really frustrating to get in a room in the healthcare space and everybody does one of these. They're like, wait a second, you know, we were paying like 20 bucks for this like 10 years ago. You know, it's 150 now. What? Like, I'm pretty sure I'm not making, you know, three, 300 times in my day. You know, this is crazy. Yeah. And so they keep, it's a complex issue. Uh, it's, it's one of the most frustrating things to deal with. Um, but I think our, our ability to have patience is quickly uh, fading away. It's <laughs> I lost patience with you today. <laughs> so, I'll let you get other items or we can have enough to before we're just yeah. about an hour in. So. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yep. there's a note. There's a, a number of different things. We've got to also figure out, hopefully it ties in with the budget too, because we also have to help to fund the board of elections with some initial, but it's gonna be clearly sort of no excuse absentee or early voting provisions I think will come out of both the House and the Senate. And I think that's extremely important for this year because we have so many folks that commute, you know, an hour plus out any one day, you could have a doctor's appointment come up or emergency, you know, let's have more participation not less. And I think there's a general consensus in both chambers that some or all yeah. or a combination of provisions will pass. If that passes, it would be valid for the presidential election. One thing that will go in effect for presidential elections, though, is that being that we passed last, last year, that children will not have school and teachers will not have to work on election day anymore. Yeah, the Prince William <laughs> County in Manassas City and closed school for primary day, March 3rd. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's just been a whole outburst of social media on that, too. And it's like, give me a break, people, come on. So, I think presidential is getting for us in the 20th of virtual teacher work workday, which is essentially not a teacher work workday. And the other thing we've done is flip the state holiday to election day. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. so then everybody will be off on election day. No more excuses to vote. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can all knock doors instead. Yeah. You can't yeah. complain if you don't vote. Yeah, that's uh, right. The vote is your vote. So there's a first, uh, oh. primary. Yeah, March 3rd. March 3rd. Um, I, I, did, I did mention that I was going to um, Joe and her friends from um, our police associates said, well, we did some work this year on the cancer presumption, and finally we got it out of the House and the Senate. And so that's been a period that I've built every single year for five, six years. Um, so this adds cancers that are directly linked to the toxins that they interface in fires. It's been a, just a long time battle. We removed provisions that got one of our firefighters who passed away caught up in legal battles for about a year before he died. We removed that section of the code. Um, and then we have a PTSD bill that is passed out of the Senate. It's over the House. It did not have a favorable action so far in the House. Steve, right? Oh, yeah. It died and then flipped back out. Yeah. Back and I think that they but, but this, this creates the first instance based on blood last year um, to provide really the first presumption in relation to PTSD and our first responders. Um, there's just so many folks that deal with either single incident or cumulative incidents over their careers. We just lost open officer two weekends ago. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, this, this story plays out uh, across the Commonwealth, um, all over the place for different reasons. and. We are not tackling the issue uh, more proactively, and we need to create a framework that says if you're struggling, you've got some framework of uh, coverage, and the folks I know and work with, they want to get back on the job too, but they're hurting. And right now, the, the mantra for so many years in these lines of service has been sort of suck it up, butter you know? And um, unfortunately, the costs really get borne by the families um, that are involved over, over time. Um, and it's time we start to flip that around. So this is the first year we're really starting to make progress to flipping this discussion. Um, yes, it'll it'll have some financial hit to localities because there's some premium issues, but hopefully those they start to think about it and do more proactive things and you know more frequent check-ins of, of sit-downs of incident reviews, other things to, to check in with uh, the mental health status of or not just single incident, but the cumulative total of the careers. Yeah. 